Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning. Thank you uh, for the honor we, uh, for this opportunity to speak in the home of Ilazaru in Kashmir. So uh, I have been given the task of speaking about biomechanics. Biomechanics per se is tough. Ilazaru biomechanics is even tougher. And once you read about uh, biomechanics, uh, especially Ilazaru biomechanics, and the newer concepts that are coming along, for example, reverse dynamization, you realize that you know nothing. But this is a basic course, so I'll make an attempt. We have to go back a little and look at the external fixator. It was started, uh, the most famous picture is the picture in 1843, Malgain's uh, clamp, which was used for uh, fixing the olecranon and the patella. And subsequently, there has been uniplanar, unilateral, Elizaro, the Taylor frame, and fixators can be classified into six types. So if you look at the clock, clock face, a monolateral uniplanar um, fixator would be the type one. And if you have a monoplanar bilateral, it would be type two. Similarly, a sectorial where the angulation between the two planes of the fixator, if you're using two planes, two plane fixator would be less than 180. Semicircular would be 180, circular would be 360. And these days, you know about the hybrid fixator. The range of the fixators is huge and uh, there are around 1,000 configurations. So you can imagine whenever there is a lot of uh, con conflict and things are developing, you know that the panacea has not been found. People are still trying to configure what is ideal. Now, you have these computerized fixators, fixators also the SUV, SUV frame, the German frame. The interesting thing is, that these days, the plate is trying to become the fixator, the fixator is trying to become the plate, the nail is trying to become the plate. So there is a sort of identity crisis. When I was a postgraduate, uh, we used to have a friction fit, the intermediary fit, and an external fixation. The biomechanical principles were totally separate. But these days, especially the youngsters, when you read these things, you'll be quite, uh, uh, you will come to know this, and most of you will be knowing this, that the principles seem to overlap to a significant degree. Now, if you look at the plate, the friction fit, fit plate, then the LC, PCP, then the PC fix, which was a point contact. And these days, the plate seems to be running away from the bone. And the plate is trying to be the external fixator. Now, why is this happening? This is the interesting part. Why is the plate trying to become the external fixator? For that, we have to look into history. So, the history, if you divide it, you can divide it into four parts, uh, the Aztecs, the Egyptians, they advocated co-optation of the bone and immobilization of the patient as well as the bone. Then Sarmento, against a lot of opposition, he said co-optation is fine, but we should start bone. That time when he said this, it was a revolutionary idea. Sir John Chandy, the famous Chandy clamp, uh, it is in the... Uh, Theater of the Bone and Joint Hospital. I hope the youngsters get to see it once in a while. He advocated compression. This was revolution. No one had compressed bones till then. You would think that the bones would die due to compression. He achieved fantastic results in the knee, knee arthrodesis. Once the AO group saw that, they saw that Sir John Chandy has got wonderful results with compression. So they expanded on this concept. They thought this is the future. So what they did, they felt that compression would lead to primary bone healing without any callus. And they advocated that callus is bad. If you see callus, you're not doing well. And over a period of time, once they dated patients for hardware removal, because their fixation used to be so good that it was very difficult to judge whether the uh, bone is united. It used to appear united on the first post optic. Such was the compression they achieved on table. But at the time of hardware removal, many of these fractures fell apart. So in 1987, they revised their guidelines for implant removal. They acknowledged that they are not rigid about rigidity, that micromotion was beneficial and desirable, and callus assists in healing. This was a paradigm shift. So till then, absolute rigidity. Suddenly, micromotion came into being. Now, an interesting line, which is very famous amongst Elizaro surgeons, is, uh, was uh, uh, quoted by Dr. J. George from Poland. 
he said that the dcps in the subcontinent are not dcps they are not good enough to be called dcps so most of his patients he felt had micro motion in the dc which ideally is not recommended and he said his union rate is very high because of that so that is serendipity then this great man he was doing this all alone silent away from the rest of the world without any access to literature we didn't have access to his literature for till 1990 as uh, professor altaf just said he also found that compression produces very good results and uh, interestingly some of his uh, bones united around the knee especially united in 3 weeks which is quite revolutionary and he was able to point out trabecular bridging so this brings us to the workshop that is the circular small wire fix it now we know with elizaro you can you aim for union you aim for deformity correction you aim for distraction osteogenesis but the core of the whole issue is stability with micro motion so the biomechanics of the elizaro is achieving stability but with micro motion now which micro motion is beneficial this is interesting if you have micro motion in the angular plane you will tend to get a horse hoof type calves if you have if there is rotatory uh, micro motion there will be hypertrophic calves formation if there is distraction at side to side motion there is atrophy and it is only dynamic compressive micro motion which causes un of course this is an oversimplification but i hope you understand the trend the idea is to try and compress the fracture and have some micro motion there but the question arises how much micro motion is beneficial should we leave it totally mobile or should we fix it totally stiff or somewhere in between and how much it is um, mentioned that less than 1 mm of micro motion is beneficial beyond that it's totally unstable doesn't cause union so you have to remember 1 mm less than one now we know that the elizaro fixator resists angular and rotatory micro motion which is beneficial it allows it allows the surgeon to control compression as well as distraction so you can compress achieve micro motion and the icing on the cake is that this bicycle spoke which was elizaro's elizaro wire initially has solved this problem to a great extent he did it because he had nothing else as we often say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention he used the bicycle spoke the bicycle spoke is now the elizaro wire now let us go back to the external fixator the external fixator uniaxial remember uniaxial is the axial, uh, external fixator against which everything else is compared so it gives extreme rigidity but in one axis you don't want extreme rigidity but it gives you extreme rigidity stability in the opposite axis is inadequate now this was solved when i was a post graduate we used to allow delta fix it we used to say stability in this plane and uh, rigidity in one axis will increase it by putting uh, another fixer in right angle to the first one the problem is the construct became too stiff that is where the term non union machine came up so this delta frame was later on known as the non union machine even though we still put it but the stiffness is just too much you must remember that a tension wire is never completely stiff and there is something known as linear stiffness if you bend a uniaxial fixator pin you keep bending it it displaces bend it put put more force it bends the elizaro wire bends up to a certain extent and then it becomes very stiff so that is the best part about this small wire it bends it's soft but beyond that it's very hard so it allows micro motion nothing more so that is the interesting part this allows telescope now once you apply an elizaro this is a very important right it allows control dynamization but it is very important that is why you see these pictures of people cycling on motorcycles driving cars because the idea is to promote full weight bearing that is where you get this micro motion of course not in all cases but in many of these cases if you have a good internal fix then you should promote full weight bearing very important only then will it act as a micro motion device now the question comes how do you achieve this micro motion what is the method of achieving micro motion how do you control stability is it possible to control stability now, whatever i am going to say it is i am going to point in one direction that is how to make the construct stiffer and obviously the other way around is once you go in the reverse direction the fixator stiffness will go down if we look at the 
external support. If you use CCM, you use stainless steel and uh, uh, carbon, the stiffness goes down. So the stiffest is CCM followed by steel. Number of rods, if you put more threaded rods between adjacent rings, stiffer is the construct. So how to make a construct stiffer? That is the external elements, material matters, number of rods matter. The diameter of the ring also matters. Smaller the ring, the stiffer it is. And if you look at the transosseous element, remember this list is by no means complete. It is incomplete, but if you look at the transosseous elements, if you put more wires, stiffer is the construct. If the diameter is more, Dr. Glonabi just said that if 6 mm, stiffer, 1.5 mm, not so stiff. Wire tension, the more you tension the wire, the stiffer it is. Transosseous separation, if you separate the two um, rings on a bone segment, near, near, far, far, near to the fracture, far from the fracture, the stiffer is the construct. And if you put these drop wires or stability elements, um, then or reductional elements, if you put them far from the main ring, stiffer is the construct. The wire angle, ideally you would want it to be 90 degrees. The problem is you can never do that. The anatomy does not allow it. Try and get 60, 60 is supposed to be neutral, but at least 30. So higher the angle, stiffer is the construct. Lower the angle, the less stiff is the construct. The construct rigidity can also be increased by angulating the pins that you put in from the drop wire area or the shans pins that you are half pins you put. The angle should ideally be 60 degrees, 120 degrees, whichever way you look at it. A bone which is right in the center of the ring is less rigidly stabilized. A bone which is near to the uh, periphery of the ring or the material of the ring, it is more stable. Obviously, this is a very controversial area. Inshallah, once we get an opportunity, we can talk about that. Now, if you look at a pin tissue interface, if you put a pin with hydroxyapatite coating, the construct will be stiffer. Loosening is less. Olive wires, stiffer construct. Simple wires, construct is not so stiff. Construct rigidity can be increased or decreased by construct transformation or modular transformation. Take out a few pins, less stiff. Add a few pins, more stiff. And this is important because once the bone starts uniting, it is important to take a few pins away at a time. Then internal stability. If the fracture area is wide, a lot of stability. If you do a peg in hole, osteotomy, more stability. If you do a W osteotomy, more stability. If it is oblique, less stable. This is internal stability, the fragment-based stability. So you have the external elements, the pin bone interface, and the internal uh, stability. But remember, the Lizarro is not so simple. There are contradictions. If you increase the diameter, you will cause operative damage. If you increase the number of wires, you get polylocal myofascial disease, which is stiffness because of the tissue disease. If you increase the support distance, bulkiness. If you increase angle, neurovascular risk. And reference positions, this is interesting. The Russians believe that if you put pins in the reference positions, you have to take care of the acupuncture meridian, lest you excite or suppress some of those acupuncture points. But how do you achieve this less than one mm goal? There is no well demarcated method to reach this optimal step. There is no method by which you can say, do this, this, and you'll achieve this. Books and YouTube help all orthopedic surgeons, but Elizabeth, I sincerely believe you still need a good old fashioned teacher. Thank you for this.